before we get into the review, um, since this will be your first time taking exams this particular way, I want to show you where everything is. Um, and to do that, I want to share my uh, browser here. Okay, so there's there's my browser, and of course, this is the way it looks for uh, the instructor. And I need to leave it that way because um, if I um, if I enter as a, a student preview, <clears throat> then we won't see any of the exams uh, because I haven't taken the syllabus preview, uh, the syllabus test. So I'm going to leave it in uh, instructor mode and show you where things are. Uh, of course, start here and then you scroll down to, let's see, the folder for exam one. And then toward the bottom, there should be a folder that says exam one for all students. And then instructions. So if you if you forget what I told you today, <laughs> once you get to this point, uh, you've got instructions to tell you what to do. And you go inside this folder. And here's an assignment. Um, so you can access the test from here. Right. But I want to open up the folder. Well, it's not a folder. I'm going to open up the assignment so that you can see where to submit your work. So once you go inside this, I'll click on that. Okay. And this shows you, you've got the fold, you've got the file here and all you have to do is right click it and save link as, and put it somewhere on your computer. Okay. So why don't I do that? I'm going to save link as, and I'll put it somewhere. Why don't I put it, uh, let's see, uh, wherever I put it, I'm going to have to share it. So let me put it on my desktop. Okay. And notice the wording here. It says uh, exam one savable. I'll explain that in a minute. Okay. So now I've got it out there. Um, while we're here, so I don't have to save and, and share and then unshare and share and share. Uh, while we're here, when you finish the exam and it's in electronic form of some kind, then this is where you submit it. You attach your file right here. So you attach your file, you browse your computer and find it. And then once it's there, you go down to, let's see, I've got it covered up on my screen. You go down to this right hand corner lower right hand corner and submit. That's it. And as long as that works, your uh, submitted exam will show up in my Blackboard um, gradebook, in my grade center. Okay. So now let's go, um, let me stop this share. And just we we'll just go look at the exam. Man, we won't look at it actually. That's not a bad good idea. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share the review document because, and the reason I'm doing that is because the review document looks exactly like the test. Okay. Is that exam one review showing? Yeah. Okay. The test will look exactly like this, um, except it won't have key up here. This is where you type in your name. And if you open up that file that you saved on your desktop or wherever you put it, <clears throat> open it up in your Acrobat reader. So you could, you could get that reader. Remember you can get a reader from uh, Adobe directly. 
or a Foxit is a good one, but whatever reader you use, they're not designed to create and edit documents. But the exams I prepared, uh, since I have a, 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 pro account, a pro version of Adobe Acrobat, I can take documents that I have created or saved into Adobe format, the PDF format, and I can uh, export them as savable files so that anybody with a reader uh, can take this form, and that's what it is. These fields are, are form fields. You can fill those in and then save your document. And that way, uh, as long as there is, you don't have to uh, do any drawing or anything, as long as you just have to fill in the fields, then you can save the document and submit it. So uh, let me take a quick look. I'm gonna do it with my hard copy. A quick look at uh, this first exam and see. I don't think there's anything in this one where you actually have to draw anything. Right, <clears throat> so this first exam, you can complete it on your computer and um, just fill in the fields and save it and then uh, submit it in that, uh, ass that assignment. Okay, so this is the review document and I hope you, you've seen this before. Um, I'll point out this, uh, if we go all the way to the bottom, let's see, down to here, at this point we start useful information. And for this first exam, I've got conversion factors here that you might need. If they're not given in the problem, sometimes they're in the problem. Densities that you might need. Formulas, like there's the density formula. Uh, this one, eh, it's missing some things. This should be uh, temperature degrees Fahrenheit right there. And this should be, no, uh, this should be temperature K. This should be K. Temperature K here because it's Celsius plus 273. And this one should be temperature Fahrenheit equals 1.8 times temperature C plus 32. Um, I'll, uh, I'll take a look at the exam and be sure it's not doing this thing. It's not wonky like that. Um, <clears throat> and then you'll also have, usually have something else along with it um, at a minimum. Well, here are your polyatomic ions. Right, so you don't have to memorize them. On this left-hand side, you've got the, you've got them in order of name, and on this side you have them in order of formula. So they're both the same. They've got the same information on either side, but one's organized different than the other. Uh, then you have your periodic table. And this is an old one. Notice, notice these uh, things right here. These squares. They've got placeholders in them, right? This, so this is an old version, <clears throat> but you're not gonna need those. You're not gonna need these down here, not for the exam. Those are not some that you would have to memorize anyway, uh, but the, the latest version does have names in here for these elements, have symbols for them. These are just placeholders. Okay, so that will definitely be there for every exam, we'll have a periodic table. And then the, You'll, you'll probably have the polyatomic ions for subsequent exams. And then you'll have this useful information and this table will grow for each exam. I'll just add stuff to it. So you'll have all this stuff plus more. Uh, okay, so let's get back to the review document. Let's go back to the top. All right, so in this review document, um, it's broken into two pieces. One is for chapter one, that's identified here, and the next section is chapter two, and the numbering starts all over again. So as I'm talking, I'm gonna have to say, uh, is it chapter one, number something? Um, because they're not ordered in sequence all the way through. 
all chapters. Um, so this is this is an old document, and when I created the uh, worked problems to go along with it, I numbered it as it is in this document. So <laughs> um, if I had gone back in and renumbered everything, then I'd go have to go back and redo all the worked problems, and I didn't have the time or the energy to do it. So that's why it remains separate chapters. Okay, so I picked out some problems here from the review document and we'll go through those as those things that I think are important and that will help you the most. And of course, 205 points would be for this review document, but it's not going to be anywhere near that large for the exam. This review document is sort of a, a pool and I extract problem types from that. Okay, uh, before I get started, are there any uh, questions or comments that we need to deal with before we go? Since we only have this one review session, um, if I run out of time and you have to leave, then I'm just going to keep going until I finish all the problems that I've identified and get them into the recording. Um, so that what that means is if I have to go over time, then the um, the Chem 103 uh, tutoring session that I normally schedule after on Wednesdays will be delayed. Okay, uh, any comments? All right, so let's see. Um, so let's start with number one. Let's see, do I need to put this one on the board? Number one says, which of the following is an example of a quantitative observation? So what do we mean by quantitative? Actually, it's quantitative versus qualitative. Quantitative nearly always means you have a number of measurement involved for that observation, which means there'll be a number and there'll be a unit of measure. Qualitative uh, is, is a generalized statement of um, either for a single substance or a single process. You're just offering descriptive terms like color, shape, state of matter, those types of changes that can occur. But you're not, uh, you're not measuring it against a standard. So let's look at what we have. A piece of metal is longer than the piece of wood. It refers to length, but it doesn't give you a definite number. So that would be qualitative. It's not quantitative. Uh, B, solution one is much darker than solution two. Similar idea. It's just a comparison in generalities. There are no numbers or units of measure associated with it. A liquid in, in beaker A is blue. So that's not a comparison. That's just a descriptive term that just says the color is blue. You know, that's... Now, if we were to take that sample and put it in a spectrophotometer and measure the wavelength of absorbance for that liquid, then we would be giving it a quantitative measure. But just as it is, beaker A is blue, that's qualitative. The temperature of the liquid is 60 degrees centigrade. That's it. None of the others were right, so D has to be the only answer. That's quantitative. Okay, uh, number two generally observed behavior that can be formulated into a statement, sometimes mathematical, is called what? Observed behavior that can be formulated into a statement. Is that an observation? Well, behavior, mm, it might be derived from an observation, right? After all, the wording is observed behavior. But is that the best answer? 
And remember, test taking techniques, if you've got a multiple choice test and you have several answers and there are no um, odd ones in there like saying none of the above or one of the above or two of the above, things like that. If you've got individual choices and nothing else, then pick the best one. Well, I'll always pick the best one. So observation will hold that one in reserve, maybe. Uh, observe behavior. Measurement, usually not measurement. Observe behavior would be more qualitative. Uh, theory. What does a theory mean? Maybe I better write on the board for this one. Uh, so this is chapter one, number two. So if we're saying theory, what do we mean by theory? Theory as opposed to what? A law. So if we, if we understand that the connection between these two is why, the law is actually the best answer here. Observe behavior that can be formulated into a statement. So we can say with a law that if the circumstances are this, then the outcome will be that. Uh, and you can, that can come in the form of uh, just a sentence or it can be a formula, right? So uh, Newton's first law, I know that's not chemistry, but Newton's first law says an object at rest will tend to remain at rest unless acted upon by an external force. And an object in motion will tend to remain in motion unless acted upon by an external force. So that's a statement of law. Um, or uh, Newton's second law is actually a formula. Right? It just says that external force that he was talking about in, in the first law is right here. And it, it will act upon that mass and it will produce an acceleration. Now that force is an unbalanced force. That is, if it's balanced perfectly, then there will be no change in position or movement. But if it's unbalanced force, then it will produce an acceleration. That's a law. It works every time, but um, it doesn't say anything about why. Now, the, um, <clears throat> When science was, modern science was first getting its, its feet on the ground, um, it wasn't called science. It was called It was called natural philosophy. Now we call it science. <clears throat> so the, their from their natural philosophy, they developed natural laws, laws about nature. And that's the best answer for this question. While it may involve an observation or even a measurement, a statement of what was learned is the natural law. Okay, that was two. All right, let's see. How about uh, number five? Order the four metric prefixes from smallest to largest. So this requires that you have memorized what these prefixes mean. So let's just put chapter one, uh, number five. So let's just put them in order from smallest to largest. All right, what do we know? What's the smallest one that we've been introduced to? Uh, I think maybe Pico was the smallest one. All right. So what does Pico mean? It means 10 to the minus 12 
times the base unit, whatever that happens to be. Next was uh, nano, 10 to the minus nine times the base unit. Then uh, that's uh, 10 to the minus nine. Uh, next is micro, 10 to the minus sixth. We're getting bigger. And then we have uh, milli, 10 to the minus third. Okay. Then what do we have? Well, let's see. These have been in thousand times unit changes. But now we're getting down into a finer detail. The next is centi, 10 to the minus two, 100 thought. And then uh, deci, 10 to the minus one. So that's extremely small to near normal, we might say. All right, so what's next? Well, uh, we're going to go larger now. So if we say uh, 10 times, let's see, I ran out of space, didn't I? So if we say uh, deca, we're saying 10 times. And by the way, what are the abbreviations for each one of these? The abbreviation for that one is just a P. And this one was a little N. And this one's a, a Greek mu letter. This one's a small m, this one's a small c, and that one's a small d. This one is a big d. Right, I'm probably scooting. Okay, we're still on. That's good. Uh, 10 times, 100 times is what? Uh, let's see. You know, I can't remember what a hundred times is. Deca center. I don't even think that one's in your list. So we'll skip that one. Uh, kilo. A thousand times. And then I think we'd go from a thousand to a million. Mega. 10 to the sixth, big M, and then possibly uh, uh, giga, 10 to the ninth, and then Terra, 10 to the twelfth. Okay, so I think that's most of them. Let's see if we have everything we need in here to answer the question. So if we're going from smallest to largest, what's the smallest one up here? Pico, are there any Picos in that list? No. Are there any Nanos in that list? Yep, there's a Nano. A is, has Nano in it. Uh, do the others have Nano? Yeah, the others have Nano. But the others with their Nanos are not the first one in the list. So test taking technique. The others cannot be right because if they've all got nano in them and they're not the first one, the smallest one, then you're done. It has to be A. Let's just look at it. Nano and then milli's bigger than that. Yep. Centi's bigger than that. Yep. Kilo's bigger than that. Yep. So that one's right. You need to use a logical process. Save your time and effort. Okay, so let's see, number six. Here we go, let's scroll up a little bit, see how far we can go. There we go. I'm gonna shrink this back down a little bit because my, my easel is not real stable. Okay, uh, 
number six. Let's see. Did I get any? No, we're staying. Number six. Okay. Number six says 8.1 kilograms contains how many grams? Or contains this many grams? 8.1 kilograms. Okay. If we want to know how many grams that is, think of it as we have stored uh, size and units of measure in the prefix. What does that kilo mean? That kilo means 10 to the third. So this right here is kilogram. 8.1 times 10 to the third grams is kilograms. So that's why B is the answer. All right. How about seven? Convert meters to millimeters. Okay, 0 0.390. Let's see, I better identify which one it is. 0 0.39. Zero, eight zero. There we go. This is meters. Okay, there are two ways to solve this problem. You can say um, meters, if we make millimeters, if we take this unit and expand it, then meters is uh, 10 to the third. Millimeters, right? Because a millimeter uh, is a thousandth of a meter, so it takes a thousand millimeters. So there we've taken it, expanded this out here. This is here. And then if we make scientific notation out of it, is that uh, possibly? It's got two types in there, standard notation and scientific. So let's see what the scientific looks like. Scientific would be this. We take that one, we have, we moved it to the right, so we have to take one away from here. Right, we took one of these powers, we took a 10 and put it over here to move that decimal to make this 0.3 into three. So we had to multiply it by 10 and the 10 comes from that unit right there. So is that one of the answers? 3.980 times 10 squared? No. So let's change this into standard notation and see if that was there. So if this one is uh, 10 squared, that means you need to move the decimal place to the right twice. Okay, 398 millimeters. A is the answer. Now that's one way to do it. The other way is use dimensional analysis. And let's just erase that and rewrite it. Let's move it over here actually. And that was uh, meters, wasn't it? Yep, yeah, meters to millimeters. Okay, so why did I write it that way? Well, we're headed for millimeters. So millimeters has to be up here in our conversion factor, and meters has to be in the denominator to cancel that meter, which is in the numerator. So now that this cancels, we just need What's the relationship between these two? Well, how many millimeters in a meter? A thousand. Like that. And then uh, we already know that we're going to need the um, standard notation. So we just move the decimal place to the right three. Right? Why? Because if we're using up this large value here, then we're transferring that large over to this, making it large. So you wouldn't move it to the left, that makes it small. 
you want to make it large because you're multiplying it by a thousand. So it has to go to the right. And then you look for that answer. All right. That was seven. Uh, let's see, let's skip down to nine. This is a question of fundamental understanding uh, in, in all sciences, actually. What's the measure of resistance an object has to a change in its state of motion? You just have to know the definition. What we're talking about here is a measurement of inertia. Inertia is relative to Newton's first law. Inertia is uh, an expression of mass. So if something has mass, it has inertia. And inertia means resistance to change. If it's at rest, it wants to stay there. If it's in motion, it wants to keep moving. That's inertia. And that's because of mass, an expression of how much substance is there. So something that has more mass, like uh, one kilogram here versus 100 kilograms here, which one has more inertia? 100 kilograms does. All right. How about, um, let's skip over here and see if we remember. Uh, right, let's do number 11. I didn't pick that one, but let's look at it anyway. With a different marker. <clears throat> I think 11 is, is, I mean, we've seen these, uh, I was headed for this 12 through 13, 12 and 13, but let's look at 11 first. Um, so you got a new balance and you're, you're playing with it. You're checking it out and you put a one gram mass on the balance. And <laughs> so what does the one gram represent? The one gram mass is probably from a set of standard weights, standard masses. So this is the accepted or true. That's the true value. Now, what is the balance telling you? The balance is telling you, you measured it three times and each time it's in the neighborhood of 1.2 grams. And this uh, plus or minus expression over here, this takes into account the inherent accuracy of the balance. You'll see that very often, plus or minus. So you're saying that the value that, that's being measured, the balance is saying it's a 1.201 plus or minus one. But for to answer our question, we don't even need that. First question, if that's the true value, is this balance accurate? No, not accurate. It's way off. It's not accurate. Now, is it precise? So you look at the different measurements, 0 0.201, 0 0.202, 0 0.200. Yes, the balance is precise because each time we measure, the value is very close to the others. And of course, if you invoke this plus or minus uh, variance, on the end, you find that each one of these measurements is within uh, 0 0.001 of a gram. So that's another indicator. So it's not accurate, but precise. Then we look for the, the choice down here that fits that, and C gives us that precise but inaccurate. Okay. Uh, we probably don't need to do 12 and 13. We're just looking at these, these things, these 
uh, gunshots or whatever they happen to be. Um, which one of the figures represent uh, results having high precision? Precision is grouping. <clears throat> so two and three are both grouped very close together. Right? That's why E is the answer for that one. Oops. Uh, which of the following statements is correct? Uh, figure one represents a systematic error. Oh, maybe we'd better look at it. 13. Thirteen. What do we mean by a systematic error? A systematic error is one that occurs the same way every time. So if you use an instrument and you make a measurement and it's an error the same amount each time, then what are you saying? You're saying that, well, two things. You're saying that the the uh, error probably contributes to a precise answer. In other words, if it's error the same way every time, then all other things being equal, when you measure it, it's going to be off by the same amount and give you a grouping over here rather than on the exact, the true value. So it will be precise. Uh, figure one represents a systematic error. No, it doesn't. Because you have no precision there. That's what we call random error. So you have two types of error. You have systematic error. And you have random error. Systematic error is actually easier to deal with. You can identify what's causing the error and correct for it. Random error, there's nothing you can do about it. Random error says the error is going to be off. You might be able to say how far it's off, but you'll never say where it is. And statistics takes that into account. So when you, when you do statistical analysis on a set of data, um, you're generally talking about what's the random error. You try to identify what are the differences for each measurement from the true value, right? And those add up to a certain difference. But then there's always this one tail out here that says there's also random error that we can't account for. And you try to minimize that value. That's all you can do. So in this case, we said A is not the answer. How about B? Figure one represents random error. That's true. And two and three are systematic error because they're very precise. Well, actually two uh, represents systematic error and three represents virtually no error. But we could say it, it does have some error. Uh, figure two represents systematic error. Okay, B is true. All right, let's see if any of the others are true. Figure one and two, random, no. One systematic, uh, random, first one's random, second one's uh, systematic. One and two, systematic, no. Three represents no error. Well, actually, there is some error in three. A little bit. Um, so the best answer for that one is B. Any question about that? I'd forgotten that that topic was in here. And that's a topic we didn't cover in class. The difference between systematic and random error and how they're related to precision versus accuracy. But if any of you are going into a medical lab tech or any type of laboratory or scientific research uh, employment in the future, you need to understand systematic versus random error. And in fact, you probably ought to take a course in statistics anyway. All right, so let's see what's next.
besides the fact that I'm running out of time. <clears throat> I've only got an hour left. We're only on the fourth page. Number 16. <clears throat> the amount of uncertainty in a measurement, measured quantity is determined by what? What can you attribute to uncertainty in a measured quantity? We know that uncertainty is always there. So what are possibilities? Well, anytime you have a measurement, generally you have a device of some kind that's being used, right? Because we talked about standards, standards of mass, length, time, uh, even derived units like volume. There are standards and you must have some sort of instrument to compare your substance to when you're making the measurement. So what's involved there? Well, you have the measuring device, the instrument. There could be error, uncertainty in, in that device. And there nearly always is in varying amounts. You generally get um, a device that you pay very little money for is going to have a lot of error inherent. Only if you buy something secondhand that's proven it's, it's worth over the years and um, you just get a bargain. But if you buy it new, you're going to pay more money for an instrument that's guaranteed to be uh, more accurate and more precise in its measurements. What else? You've got the operator. You know, the person that's doing the observing or operating the instrument, their skill often has a huge bearing on the uncertainty or lack thereof in a measurement. So really the only one that fits is A, both the skill of the observer and the limitations of the measuring instrument determine the uncertainty in a measured quantity. How about 17? Okay, a scientist obtains a number, and this, this number is 17. Uh, 05, 0 0.04500. Zero, zero. And then followed by 67, zero, zero. Okay. That's what the calculator spits out. If this number actually should be limited to four significant figures, how should it be written? All right. That's the question. Four significant figures in our answer is what we're looking for. Well, you want to know, are we expressing this in standard notation or in scientific notation? Right, so you look at your answers to give you a clue. Right? It looks like all the answers are in standard notation. So we're not going to bother with scientific notation. We're just going to figure out where are the four significant figures. Well, you start from the left, right? Zero, nope. Next zero, nope. All left-hand zeros are not significant. So this is our first one, four, five, zero, zero. That position right there, that's where we have to stop. So now we have to say rounding. How are we gonna round it? because we've got this number here that's six greater than five, which means this one has to be one. One, two, three, four. So 0 0.04501, 0 0.04501 right there, E is the answer. Okay, uh, 17, let's skip to 20. Express this number in scientific notation, right? That should be simple. Uh, 0.0810. Let's see, that's number 20. Scientific notation has two parts to it, right? Has the coefficient 
and it has the exponent, power of 10. So if we move to the right, what does that do to the, if we move the decimal to the right, to give us the correct coefficient between one and 10, three significant figures, right? These don't count. Then how big is this one? Does it go negative or positive? Well, we move to the, to the right and we stored up small value. One, two, 10 to the minus two. Right. So we moved tenths, hundredths, tenths, hundredths. We went one like that, and then we next one is like that. So one hundredth means 10 to the minus two. That's what 10 to the minus two means. It's one divided by 100. Right? That's equal to one divided by 10 squared. And if we bring 10 squared in the numerator, you change the sign to a negative. Uh, okay, so that one was uh, D. Okay, we're still in chapter one and we're on 21. Express this number in decimal form or standard notation. 6.49 times 10 to the minus three. And it's 21, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so if you've got this one, what is 10 to the minus third? It's 1,000th of. So if we're going to make this into standard notation, which way does that decimal move? If you move it to the right, you're saying that the number's getting bigger. But that 10 to the minus third means that it should be a very small number. So intuitively, you should say, oops, move the wrong direction. Then you go this way. One, two, three. Oops. Zero, zero, six, four, nine. All right, so that's A. Uh, let's see, do we need to mess with, uh, no, we don't need to do D. You know that if the power of 10 is large, then you need to move the decimal to the right to make the number bigger. How about 23? We generally report a measurement by recording. Okay, this is definitional. We report a measurement by measuring all of the certain digits plus how many uncertain digits? It's always just one. The last digit is the uncertain digit. It's a guess. An educated guess if you're if you're a confident scientist, but it's still a guess. Okay, 24. All right. Okay, you're asked to determine the perimeter of the cover of your textbook. You measure the length at so many centimeters and the width at uh, so many centimeters. How many significant figures are in those measurements? This one has four, they're all non-zero, so they have to be significant. This one has four, they're all significant. How many significant figures should you report for the perimeter? Both of them have four, and this is the multiply rule, right? So the answer will have four, uh, excuse me. You measure the length as how many? Oh, I didn't even read the question, did I? What's the question? Report for the perimeter, not for the area. It's not a multiply, it's an add subtract rule, right? I hoist it on my own petard, as they say. So what would that be? 39.36, right? That's on the length on one side, that's up, coming back down, you need two of them. And then on the width, 2483, 
taken twice. Now you can you can do the calculation, but you only need to know how many significant figures are there, right? So we line up the decimals and we can have all the way over to here. So we can have that position, that position, this position would be what? Let's see, eight and 18 is 26. So we carry the two and two, four, six, six plus six is 12. Right, 12, so that gives us two more positions. So that's why the answer is five significant figures in the answer because of the addition rule. Right? If you say four, that's wrong, right? because we actually added one to our answer. And we did it legally. Okay, uh, 26, how about this one? So here's a combination. 26. And we have 6.167 plus 68 divided by 5.10. All right. So what's missing from this expression? Parentheses, right? We're giving no instruction and help in how, what's the order of calculation. You would normally think, add these two together and then divide. But since we're not given parentheses, we have to go we have to go to that. PEMDAS, no parentheses, no exponents. So then we do what? Multiply, and there's no multiply, there's divide, right? So if there's divide, how are we gonna divide this one into that? We have to divide into each one, right? This one into that one, and that one into that one, okay? So if we divide this one into this one, that gives us three significant figures. I hope I'm doing this right. I have a sneaking suspicion that it's going to give me the wrong answer or an answer that's not in the selections. <laughs> but let's see what we end up with. 6.167 and then 5.10. So that half gives us three significant figures. 1.2. One, round it off. Then plus this one divided into that one. Yep, uh, 68 and 5.10. So that one can only have two significant figures which would make it uh, 13. Okay, now 13 plus 1.21, we'd have to go 13, 1.21, 1, 2, 4, 1. And we have to stop it at that decimal point. So this is, we stop it right here, and that two is less than five, so our answer should be 14. Is that one of our se selections? No, it's not. Okay. So I'm telling you what, what happened here was the addition was done first, then the division. So they did it backwards. What does that mean? That means that the rules are up for grabs, if that's the correct answer. Is C is 15. Let's see if they did it that way. If they did it that way, we'd have to add that one together first. So that's 
we have to hold it to the first decimal place, so it's 74. Divided by 5.10. So now we can have two decimal places. Rounded off to 15. Yep. So that's what the authors did. They did this one first, then divided by 5.10. Now, here's what I think is happening. Because these two are in the numerator, they're assumed to be first in order. They're assumed to be parenthetical. So you would do those first and then divide. I can't give you a good answer. Um, all I can say is, I'll need to go into the exam and be sure that there's not one like that in there because that's confusing, right? Which, which is the order? One gives you that answer and one gives you this answer. And only this answer is there for this problem, right? So that could be a problem. Let me, uh, let me mark that one as, uh, Check that one out. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's look at. about 37 37 here we go uh, pressure of the earth's atmosphere at sea level is 14.7 pounds per square inch what's the pressure in grams per square meter so let's see we got 37 and we're starting off with 14.7 pounds per square inch, okay? And we want grams per square meter. Is that still on the board? Yeah, it's still there. I'm kind of twisting though, I'm straighten it out a little bit. Okay, so when you've got um, unit conversion and it requires you to change two or more units in the beginning number, do one at a time. So I just take the top one first, pounds to grams. What are we given as our uh, pounds per kilogram? All right, so we're going to go like this. We get rid of pounds and we can go to kilograms. 2.205, right? Now we need to go to grams. 10 to the third grams per kilogram. Okay, that's done. Now we'll do square inches. The conversion factor we're given is 2.54 centimeters equals one inch. So we can convert inches, we can convert from the English system or the imperial system to the metric system with that conversion. But then we've got to take the metric and carry it on to square meters. So inches on top in this case, that's square inches but we only know that one inch equals 2.54 centimeters, all right? So how do we get square out of that? Well, the relationship between one inch and 2.5 centimeters, uh, if we square both the top and the bottom, 
then we haven't changed the ratio, right? You can square the whole thing like that. So now you got square inches here and square centimeters there. Okay, so that gets rid of this one, including that. Now we've got this squared and that squared. So we need to go from square centimeters to square meters. So I'm gonna have to come down here. Right, so we need to get rid of centimeters. It's on top, meters it's on the bottom, and we have a, a hundred centimeters per meter. Right, but those are linear. We need area, squared. So I square it. So now we have square meters down here, square centimeters here, that cancels that square centimeters. And we've done all of our thinking. So you just need to crunch the numbers and be careful. This number times that number times that number times this number squared, which is one, times this number squared, which would be 10 to the fourth, right? Two to the power, two squared is four. So this would be 10,000, be two squared, 10 to the squared, squared. Then go back and divide that answer by 2.205 divided by one, divided by 2.54 squared. divided by one squared. And that's your answer. Okay. The reason I wanted to do this problem is for two things. One is you're changing your unit conversions are for two units in the same measurement. And the other is you've got a, a power problem, uh, a squared units of measure. So that's how you deal with it. If you know the linear value, then all you have to do is square the ratio and you've got your conversion factor. Okay, and that should turn out to be B. 1.03 times 10 to the seventh grams per square meter. All right. Uh, let's see. I was going to look at 41, but uh, that's just density. The density of liquid uh, mercury is this. What's its density in units of pounds per cubic inch? That's a problem just like this one, right? In that case, notice you've only got linear conversion factors. So you can probably guess that you're going to have to cube one of them to get that cube out of it right there. Cube, maybe you have, may have to cube more than one, but it's the same process, right? It's nothing special. It's just if you have a linear ratio and you need the cube, just cube the whole thing. All right, so let's move on. Uh, 46, let's see what 46 has to offer. During a physics experiment, an electron ex is accelerated to 93% of the speed of light. What's the speed of the electron in miles per hour? All right, I'll set this one up for you, but I'm not gonna work the math because really the hard part is, is thinking through. What's the question? What's the speed of the electron in miles per hour? And that was uh, 46. All right. So we want to convert the speed of that electron into miles per hour. And the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. But the electron is moving at only 93% of that value. 
So how do you convert that into 93% of what it is? Well, 93% is parts per hundred. So if it's 93 parts per hundred, the fraction of that would be 0 0.93, would it not? Or you can just write 93 over 100. That's your starting point. And remember, that's a dimensionless number. It has no impact on these values. Now that you've got meters per second, you need to convert to uh, miles per hour. Right? So if we do miles, uh, let's see, excuse me, meters. Uh, per kilometer. So we got to convert to kilometers first. Thousand meters in a kilometer. Right? Got rid of that one and that one. So now we can convert to from kilometers to miles. And we need that conversion factor. 0.6214. miles per kilometer. Uh, and then that got rid of uh, kilometers. Now we got miles. We've done that unit. Now we need to go to seconds. Uh, seconds to hours. All right? Do you know how many seconds are in an hour? Well, maybe you do. I do. But what if you don't? You know how many seconds are in a minute, don't you? 60. So I get seconds and seconds. How many minutes in an hour? 60. Now you got hours. Whoops. What did I do wrong? I put them in the wrong place, didn't I? That's in the denominator. So seconds needs to be in the numerator here. There we go. That's done. Denominator, numerator, denominator, numerator. There we go. So now it's just crunching numbers. Um, Another point I wanted to make while we're here. Uh, if you do the calculations, you should end up with uh, E, 6.2 times 10 to the 8 miles per hour. Notice that in this conversion factor, 1 kilometer equals 0.6214 miles. So here's, uh, I'm going to erase all this stuff because I need the space. Notice in a conversion factor, if the um, well, let's use this for instance, uh, miles, and going to kilometers. Right? If we're going from miles to kilometers, and the mile is larger than the kilometer, right? The unit of the mile is bigger than a kilometer. Then the conversion is going to be the opposite. The relationship then is going to be less. So if the unit of measure gets smaller, the conversion gets larger. Or if the unit of measure gets small, uh, larger, the conversion unit gets smaller. They're they're opposite one another. Um, another example. Say we're going from, uh, let's say we want to go from meters to millimeters. Okay. So how about the size of the unit? What's the size of the unit from meters to millimeters? A meter is a lot bigger than a millimeter, right? So the size of the unit is going down. So the conversion from one to the other goes up. 
takes a thousand of these to make one of those. Okay, that's just the way it is. If the size of the unit gets smaller, the conversion or the multiplier gets bigger. If we were going the other direction and we we're going from here to here, this would be getting the size of the unit would be getting bigger. So the multiplier would be smaller, be 10 to the minus third. <clears throat> All right. I know we're going to run out of time. So I'm not even worried about it now. I'm just going to keep going. Unless you have a question. Stop me at any time. Uh, let's see. Oh, 49. <clears throat> In 1928, 29.3 grams of a new element was isolated from 660 kilograms of the ore, molybdenite. The percent by mass of this element in the ore was what? All right. So what is percent? Parts per hundred, right? Which means that the parts per hundred parts, the part, the part part <laughs> has to be the same unit of measure. Right? So if we're going to say the percent by mass, is equal to uh, the new element, 29.3 grams, divided by the total mass, which is what? 660 kilograms? Those are two different measures, right? We can't do that, not for this calculation. How many grams is a kilogram? A thousand times. So you need a thousand more of these to make grams. Now you can do that. So 29.3 divided by 660 times 10 to the third times 100 is your percent. So I get, uh, let's see. Uh, they're using standard notation, so I got to report this number as, let's see, how many significant figures do I have? Two. So I can only keep two. Rounded off 4.4 .4 times 10 to the minus third percent is, I move it three places to the left. One, two, three. Three, zero point zero zero four four percent. Okay, so that's why the answer is D. The trick to this problem is not just knowing what the formula is, but to recognizing that the units of measure have to match. You can't use two different measurements. and expect to get the right answer because it was kilograms to start with. There's not much of that new element in the ore, is there? It's a pretty small amount. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's see. How about a temperature conversion? 409 Kelvin equals what? Notice you've got in your answer, you've got Fahrenheit and centigrade. So, what do you know about Kelvin? Uh, 50. Well, you know this conversion. Kelvin temperature is C plus 273. All right. So if Kelvin is 409, what's C? We well, subtract this one from that one. 409 minus 273, which is 136 degrees C. Now, do we need to go to Fahrenheit? Well, let's look at the answers. 
136 degrees C is D. There's the answer. You don't even need to go to Fahrenheit. All right. That problem will take you about 15 seconds to do. Uh, 51. How about this one? The melting point of a certain element is 391C. What's this in Fahrenheit? All right. That question says you have to convert it. So if we've got uh, 391C and we're looking for Fahrenheit, what's the conversion for that? Okay. So you can plug C in here. Multiply by 9 fifths or 1.8. 391, enter, and 32 plus. So that's rounded off to three places is 736. Is that one of our choices? Yep, D. Now, why do I... You may ask yourself, why do I prefer nine-fifths? Well, the simple answer is that's the way I memorized it when I was a student. But it's, it's become useful in estimating temperatures. So what I know is if I start off at a temperature of something here, say 20 degrees centigrade, what's the Fahrenheit going to be? Well, the number of uh, degrees is uh, 20 divided by 5. For every 5 degrees centigrade, I get 9 degrees Fahrenheit. So if I know that 20 here is equal to 68 here, right? do the math, check me out. Those are my starting points. So I know for every five increase here, I get nine here. So if I go to 25C, I'm up here to uh, 77. If I go to 30 here, I'm up to 86. Or if I go down to 15, then I drop this one by nine, which would be 59. Okay, so I can, in my head, I can uh, drive by one of these banks that has the temperature on it and say I'm going too fast to wait for the Fahrenheit. I can see the centigrade, the Celsius. I see the Celsius. I can estimate what Fahrenheit is. Yes, right, just driving along. Okay, uh, let's see. Um... 54. All right, 54. In 1984, some drums of uranium hexafluoride were lost in the English Channel. Okay. <laughs> what I see here is a lot of blue smoke. Whoever wrote this problem is blowing smoke in your face, trying to distract you. So you've got to dig out. What's the question? Well, the question is, What's the physical state of the uranium hexafluoride in those drums? Do we have information to help us with that? Well, uh, the water of the channel is 17 degrees centigrade Celsius. The melting point of uranium hexafluoride is, one, is 148 Fahrenheit. We can't compare those two, right? The temperature if it's greater than 148 Fahrenheit, they'll melt. If it's less than 148, it'll freeze. So we need to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius and compare it to that 17 degrees. Right. So 148 Fahrenheit equals 9 fifths centigrade plus 32. So 32 subtracted from that is uh, 116. And then we, uh, five-ninths of that 
is about, right? You take this over here is five ninths. Five ninths is about a half, right? So a half of that would be in the neighborhood of 60 degrees centigrade. Doesn't have to be exact unless we're close to this value, but we're nowhere near it. So the, the temperature of the water would have to be greater than 60 degrees centigrade in order to melt it. And it's not, it's a lot less. So that means that uranium hexafluoride is solid. Simple. Well, it looks simple, <laughs> but I was trying to give you a method of solving the problem um, in the face of all that smoke. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's one that might throw you for a spin. 56. Fifty-six says a monolayer. What's a monolayer? That's a term that refers to a sheet of molecules, only one molecule thick. Monolayer. Mono means one, so it's one to make a layer. Uh, it contains three point two three times ten to the minus six grams of oleic acid. Oleic acid is a fatty acid, and we've got it. Everybody's got some in their body, and we consume it in our food. Only it's not free acid yet. When we eat it, it's part of a true fat. But the, uh, the uh, monolayer of oleic acid has an area of 20.0 square centimeters. Where? It's on water. Doesn't say that, does it? Uh, okay, that's an error. It should say that this monolayer is sitting on top of the water. Now, how do you do that? If you if you drop oil or fatty acid on water, it's uh, it's polar on one end and nonpolar on the other. So the polar end is going to be attracted to the water, and the molecule is going to stand up like this. Say this is the polar end. This is water. It's going to stand up like that. Right? So that's why it's a monolayer. It's going to be like this, and they're all going to be lined up like that. So there's your monolayer. We know the area is 20 square centimeters. Okay. Uh, we know the mass is this value, uh, 3.23 times 10 to the minus 6 grams. And we know the density of oleic acid is 0 0.895 grams per milliliter. Okay. What's the question? How thick is that layer? All right, what do you need to know to find the thickness? You need to know geometry. You need to know that a cylinder, what this stuff is in, is in a monolayer in an area, right? So what is it? It's actually a cylinder. Like that, with the molecules sticking up like that. So what do we know? We know the area here is 20 square centimeters. What do we need to know? If we know the height of that cylinder, we know how long that molecule is. So we need this value, the height right there. So what do we know about the volume of a cylinder? It's area times height. So the volume of our cylinder is area times height, okay? We know the area, we got the area. How about the volume? Do we know what the volume is? Not yet. We know the mass that's contained 
in that uh, mono layer, and we know the density. So what do we know about density? Density equals mass divided by volume. There's our volume right there. So we got this one, and we got density here, and we got mass. So we can solve for volume. So solve this one for volume. Put the mass in here, grams. Put the density in here, grams per milliliter. All right, so what's grams per milliliter? Grams per milliliter is the same as grams per cubic centimeter. So grams per cubic centimeter, right? That gives us a relationship from centimeters to centimeters. So find out what the volume is, plug that value in here, then solve for that one because you know what this one is. Now you know what this one is, okay? Those are the steps to solving that problem. I'm gonna let you do it at home since I'm running short of time. All right, so let me see. Uh, how about, let's see. Here we go. So what do we have here in these pictures? What we have is a representation of uh, elements or compounds. Now, how do we represent the elements or compounds? Well, the elements are single dots. Some of them are clear and some of them are colored. Right? So here we have an element there and a different element there. Here we have all the same element. Plus, they're arranged regularly, packed close together. Here we have uh, not regular arrangement and not the same element. We have two different elements here. We have that clear one and we have the gray one. Now, what do we have here? Well, we got another element in here. This is a square, clear square. But now we've got a clear and a gray linked together. That represents a compound, a molecule. And this one also represents molecules, but they're all the same molecule. So let's say, which are pure substances, right? They only have the same type of substance in them. This one's pure, right? It's only one molecule. This one's pure, only one element. What's this one called? That one's called a mixture. How about this one? That one's a mixture. How about this one? Well, this is an atomic mixture. This one's an atomic molecular mixture. It's got atoms and molecules mixed together. Okay, with that information, let's see if we can answer the questions. Which, which best represents a homogeneous mixture of an element and a compound? Right? Read it backwards element and compound okay where do we have an element we got an element and a compound here nope nope those are all elements that's all compound so e is the only possible answer there and as it turns out it is homogeneous you look how it's distributed okay how about 71 which best represents a gaseous compound Okay, so read it backwards. We need compounds, and that's it. So we got compound here, but no, it's, it's a mixture. We need a gaseous compound only. So what do we know about gases? The particles in a gas are very far apart, right? That doesn't work, that doesn't work. Uh, this could possibly work, but it's not a pure compound. It's got an element in it. 
And those are all elements. This is the only one that fits the bill. Far apart and a compound. That's why C is 71. 72, which best represents a solid element? We need an element and it has to be solid. That's not an element. That's not an element. It's a mixture. That's a mixture. That's a mixture. This is the only element in there. And as it turns out, it's a solid. Regular arrangement of atoms that are all the same. That's why B is the answer there. Which best represents a heterogeneous mixture of two elements? Right? So we need two elements in a mixture, heterogeneous. Two elements. Nope, that's got a compound, that's got a that's pure. That's pure. These are two elements, right? These are two elements, but what else do they need to be? Heterogeneous. These are far apart. Remember what I said about gases? If you mix two gases together, you always get a homogeneous mixture. So that can't be, that's homogeneous. This is the only one that fits. D. Okay. So, yeah, I got about five minutes. Uh, let's see. We'll take a, a quick stop at number 80. We won't spend a whole lot of, whole lot of time here. <clears throat> when we separate mixtures, the identity of the substances that are mixed together, whether they're compounds or elements, never changes before and after the separation. So the separation has to be physical. And the separation is based upon what is the difference between the two or more members of that mixture. If the, um, if the difference is particle size, or maybe one is a liquid and the other one is a suspended solid, then the difference there allows us to filter them and separate them. So that would be particle size would say filtration. What about distillation? What's the difference that we're keying on there? The difference there is one is more volatile than the other. So if you add a little heat to it, one of them is going to evaporate faster than the other. And when it does, it becomes a gas, then we can condense it by cooling it and we get separation. So difference in volatility means distillation is a good tool. So that's the answer to this one. Um, moonshiners use that all the time, right? They take their mash, heat it up. Ethanol is more volatile than water, so it comes off. The trick, though, is what's more volatile than ethanol in that mash? Methanol. Wood alcohol, that's the stuff that if you drink it, it'll make you blind if it doesn't kill you. So <laughs> a moonshiner that uses Volatility and distillation will take the first component that comes off and throw it away. And only after that, with experience, they know, okay, it's safe to collect the ethanol now. Um, solvent extraction. Solvent extraction is where you take a, a substance. Um, it could be liquid mixture. It could be solids. And the solvent extraction says how soluble is are the compounds in this matrix as the solvent. So you put the solvent in there and it differentially is, is prefers to extract one versus the other. Okay. I've used it on solids and liquids. Paper chromatography. Paper chromatography uh, is a juxtaposition of the parts of the mixture as they move past paper. 
They're dissolved in a, in a liquid solvent. And as it passes the paper, they spend some time on the paper and some time in the solvent. So differential attraction, solubility actually in the, in the carrier stream is the, what you're keying on there. Okay. All right, we're in chapter two and I got three minutes. So I'm gonna keep going. And uh, let me check my uh, roster here to see if anybody else Anybody I was missing earlier has showed up? No. Okay, so everybody's accounted for. I just need to talk about chapter two now. Okay. Who were the, number one, who were the first people to attempt to explain why chemical changes occur? Right? Did the alchemists do that? No. <laughs> metallurgists, well, the alchemists were in, in some respects metallurgists, but uh, metallurgists actually span uh, centuries. Um, but they weren't an easily identifiable single group. So actually the best answer here is the Greeks. The Greeks were the first to try to explain chemical change. They got it wrong, of course, but they made an attempt. Um, how about number two? The first chemist to perform truly quantitative experiments was, right? And this requires that you've read the textbook because that's what it's going to say. Who was the first quantitative experimenter? Turns out it was Robert Boyle. And we're going to study Robert Boyle a little later when we look at gases. The three, the scientist who discovered the law of conservation of mass. During a chemical reaction, the mass of the reactants is equal to the mass of the products. That was Antoine Lavoisier, a Frenchman, obviously, who was um, uh, pretty well to do. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't aristocracy, I don't think, but he was pretty wealthy. And he was bent on making more money. So in those days, if you wanted to become a tax collector, um, you got the king to patronize you. Sometimes you even had to buy the contract to collect taxes. And what that meant was uh, you collected taxes from people and the king said, this is how much I want. And anything you collect extra than the taxes, you get to keep. And the people didn't care too much for that because they could easily think that Lavoisier was cheating them. He may have been, I don't know. But unfortunately, Lavoisier lived in a, in a revolutionary era. <laughs> so when the French Revolution rolled around, uh, a different power structure came into being and they eventually instigated the reign of terror. They wheeled out their guillotine and anybody they didn't like got their head chopped off. And Lavoisier was one of them. But he's considered to be the father of modern chemistry. He uh, postulated the law of conservation of mass. Uh, how about four? Which of the following pairs of compounds can be used to illustrate the law of multiple proportions? So multiple proportions, uh, let me get down here, come on. There we go, multiple proportions, right here. So what do we mean by multiple proportions? Well, first of all, the law says that you need uh, two elements together and you need a series of compounds that are different from one another. And you go this compound, this compound, this compound, this compound. And if you hold one of those elements constant, for each one of them, the ratio to the second one changing from this compound to this one is always a whole number multiple. 
Like, so if this one's one to one, the next one might be one to two, one to three, one to four. That's multiple proportions. So in order to pick out which ones of these would work, we need to find uh, a binary pair that, uh, that has the same elements on both sides of the pair. So here's ammonia and ammonium chloride. So that can't be, we got an extra chlorine in there. We can't even do the hydrogens and the nitrogens. How about this one? Zinc is there, but oxygen's on this side and chlorine's on that side, so that one's out. Water, it's got hydrogen, but this one's got oxygen and chlorine again. Can't be. Here's nitrogen and oxygen, nitrogen and oxygen. Okay, now we're getting warm. This one is one to one, and this one is one to two. There's your answer. Multiple proportions. We don't even have to go to E. Besides, it's wrong. Okay, uh, how about, uh, let's see what seven has to say. Okay, a sample of chemical X. Chemical X is found to contain five grams of oxygen and 10 grams of carbon. So it's got five grams of oxygen and 10 grams of carbon. Okay, that's given. Oh, and 20 grams of nitrogen. 20 grams of nitrogen. There we go. The law of definite proportions would predict what? First of all, what's the law of definite proportions? It says that if you have the same compound, it doesn't matter where it came from, the ratio by mass of all of the elements in that compound is the same. That defines the compound. Um, so if we say that uh, we have a 70 gram sample of X, how many grams of carbon would you have? So if the total is 70 grams, how much carbon would you have? Well, let's see. If we have these together, 5, 15, 35. So that's 35 grams total. Okay. So this ratio is fixed. Five grams per 35, 10 per 35, 20 per 35. So if we've got 10 grams of this for every 35 grams total, what if we double the grams total? What does that do to carbon? It doubles it. So now we have 20 grams of carbon in this sample. That's why E is the answer. I need getting a fresh marker. These markers are crapping out on me. Yeah, let me see what colors I have to choose from. Here's a dark green. I wonder if that'll work. Let's try it. Uh, let's find a number first. Let's see. Well, I won't have to write for this one. How about 11? The chemist credited for inventing a set of symbols for writing elements and a system for writing the formulas of the compounds. Also discovered selenium, silicon, thorium, etc. Who was that? I think I mentioned that during our last meeting. Or it could have been another class. I don't know. 
The guy's name was Berzelius. He was a Swedish chemist, I believe. And he proposed the current system for symbols for the elements. Uh, Avogadro's hypothesis states what? Well, Avogadro said that if you have two gases, 12, if you have two gases and they have equal volume and they're at the same temperature and they're at the same pressure, then what else is equal? The number of moles, or the number of particles in each container is equal. Okay, so which one of these fits that? At the same temperature, pressure, equal volumes of different gases contain equal numbers of particles. D, that's the only one that fits. How about 13? I don't know if that green's going to show up very well. Let me try a different color. Uh, 13. The first scientist to show that atoms emit negative particles. Right? Who did that? J.J. Thompson, using his cathode ray tube, demonstrated that atoms emit, can emit, negative particles that were later called electrons. Uh, let's see. Which of the fa which of the experiments listed below, 14, did not give the results described? Okay. So first, Rutherford's experiment proved the Thompson plum pudding model. Did it? <laughs> no. It disproved it, actually. The Rutherford experiment was useful in determining the nuclear charge on the atom. Well, yeah, because of the nuclear model that he had, we knew that atoms are neutral. And if we had a nuclear atom, then, and we knew also that electrons were a negligible mass, then if his alpha particles were deflected, they had to hit the nucleus. And the electrons would contribute nothing. So rather than the electrons and the, and the positive whatever being mixed together in a plum pudding, the positive charge was centered in the nucleus. That's the only place it could be. Millikan's oil drop uh, experiment showed that the charge on any particle is a simple multiple of the charge on the electron. Yes. He did determine the elementary charge, which was 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. Uh, the electric discharge tube proved that electrons have a negative charge. Yeah, that's J.J. Thompson. So which one is uh, did not give the results described? That would be A. Right? We determined that, that Rutherford, this statement here, was wrong. Uh, how about 15, the scientist whose alpha particle scattering, oh, uh, we already talked about him. That's Ernest Rutherford, 15. Uh, let's see, do I want to look at 16? Yeah, 16. Alpha particle beams at thin metal foil may what? They may pass directly through without changing direction? Yeah. If they miss the nucleus, sure. Uh, they could be slightly diverted by attraction to electrons. Um, yeah, they could be diverted, right? Because we know that alpha particles are positive to charge and electrons are negative, so they could pull them aside. We didn't mention that in the lecture, but that's true. 
uh, they could be reflected by direct contact with the nucleus. Oh yeah, they could be bounced off in, the, in opposite side directions or they could be bounced straight back. So all of those are possible. E would be the answer to that one. Uh, while we're here, 17, which one of the following statements about a, atomic structure is false? An atom is mostly empty space. Yep, that's true. Uh, most of it is taken up by electrons. Nucleus is very, very, very small. Almost all of the mass of the atom is con concentrated in the nucleus. That's true also because electrons weigh uh, 1,840 times less than a proton. The protons and neutrons in the nucleus are very tightly packed. Uh, yeah, they would have to be to occupy that very small space. The number of protons and neutrons is always the same in the neutral atom. Uh, wrong, right? That can't be right because we know isotopes, where we have two of the same element, but each atom has a different mass. That's an isotope. How about 20? Which of the following atomic symbols is incorrect? All right, so how do you solve this problem? Well, you've got the symbols, right? And remember, the symbols and the number of protons or the atomic number in the lower left-hand corner, they have to match, indicate one another. So let's look at those first. Carbon, you need your periodic table. What's the atomic number of carbon? It's six, so that, one, that one's good. How about chlorine? Look at our table, chlorine is 17, that's right. Phosphorus, phosphorus is 15, atomic number. Potassium is 19. Uh, yes. Nitrogen. Nitrogen should be seven. So that can't be right. E has to be wrong. How about 21? The element rhenium. Now you didn't have to memorize that one. But this is true. Rhenium, R-E, exists as two stable isotopes and 18 unstable isotopes. Smoke, blue smoke. Rhenium-185 has in its nucleus protons and neutrons. How many of each? So this is 21. Rhenium. So how would we know the number of protons? It's not given there. You gotta look it up. You gotta find it in the periodic table. So it might take some searching if you haven't memorized it already. But rhenium is right down here somewhere. Nope, not that one. This one right here, right there. Okay. RE, 75 protons. Ato atomic number is 75. Okay. And we're told that uh, 185. When we say rhenium-185, when we say the name of the element dash-185, what do we mean? This is the mass number for that isotope, 185, when we say it that way. So that means this and the number of okay subtract the number of protons from the total and you get the number of neutrons zero one, one. so there are 110 neutrons 75 protons 110 neutrons d is the answer to 21 okay how about um, yeah let's do 28 that's a tricky one
Let's see, 28. Here we go. A species with 12 protons and 10 electrons. So we've got something here that has 12 protons with only 10 electrons. So what does that mean? What's, it means it has a charge. It's got 12 pluses and only 10 negatives. So what is the charge? Two plus. Okay. So if it's two plus, that means that D is wrong and E is wrong. Neither one of those can work. But C, B, and A each have two plus charges. We just need to find out what is X. How do you find X? 12 protons means the atomic number is 12. Look on your periodic table and you find that 12 corresponds to magnesium. So that's why C is the answer. Uh, I'm going to skip that one. Let's see about 33. Which of the following are incorrectly paired? So it looks like from our selection that only one of them can be wrong. Thirty-three, incorrectly paired. I'm not going to write this one on the board. <clears throat> so let's see, is this right? SR, what is SR? Strontium. Strontium is an alkaline earth. It's in the second group, which makes it an alkaline earth metal. That's true. TA, tantalum. Where do you find it? You find it uh, in transition metals. Just look on your periodic table. Even if you don't know what TA means, I can't remember if I asked you to memorize that one or not. I don't think I did. But if you look for TA and find it, it's going to be in transition metals. That's true. You ought to know this one. F is fluorine. It's a halogen. Right? H is hydrogen. Is hydrogen a noble gas? <laughs> no. Hydrogen reacts with almost anything. So there's your answer. And if you look at uh, ruthenium, it's a transition metal. So hydrogen is the wrong one. Um, these give you practice with your, if you see one of these types of questions, you pay attention to the question. If it says which one is incorrect, then you look for the one that doesn't match and the rest of them should be right. See if you memorized your symbols. Uh, all of these are characteristic of metals except what? Metals are good conductors of heat. Yes. Metals are malleable. Yes, they can be bent, shaped. They're ductile. They can be stretched into thin wires. They're often lustrous. They are if you polish them. Uh, tend to gain electrons in chemical reactions? No. Metals, as a class, tend to lose electrons during a chemical reaction. All right, how about 41? Let's see what 41 has to say. Uh, oh, we did one like this already. I think we did one of these in, uh, in a lecture too, right? So you're deducing what M is. I know we did that one in the lecture, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spend time on this one. I should have known better. Uh, how about 45? How many oxygen atoms are there in, in one formula unit of CA3 parentheses PO4 sub 2? 45. Okay. How many oxygen atoms in there? 
Well, there's four, there are four in this unit right here, this polyatomic ion, but you've got two of those polyatomics. So that means there are eight. That's why the answer is D. Now, what will be the name of this while we're here? Well, first of all, is it a type one, type two, or type three? That's a metal. It's either a one or a two. That's an alkaline earth metal. It's always two plus. So it's a type one. That means we only have to say calcium. And then the polyatomic ion that you may have to look up, phosphate. Fixed charge, fixed charge. We don't have to say what the charge on the calcium is. Calcium phosphate is unambiguous. Take that name and you can write that compound. Okay, uh, let's see. All right, we got some namings right here, but I think we've got some examples over here also. Yeah, let's skip those naming ones. I mean, you should try to do them. Um, you need to pay attention to where the metal comes from as to whether you need a Roman numeral. Iron is a transition metal. You need a Roman numeral, right? So that's a hint. Uh, what do we say Ca2 plus is? It's a calcium ion. It's an alkali metal. It can only have one charge, so we don't have to say what the charge is, even when we're talking about the ion itself. Ca2 plus is calcium ion, period. No Roman numeral needed. Uh, V3 plus. Vanadium comes from where? You did have to memorize this one. This was a transition metal, so we do need to say what is the charge. When we say vanadium, we have to say three plus. We have to say vanadium three ion. Correct name for P3 minus. It's a phosphorus derived from phosphorus. It's an ion. But it's a uh, non-metal ion, right? So we don't say phosphorus ion, right? Remember when we name things, the anion half ends in IDE. So it's phosphide ion. And it comes from the uh, nitrogen group. It's under nitrogen. And those are always three minus. So all we have to say is phosphide ion. That's it. It's unambiguous. Hey! Damn cat again. Tearing up my house. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's, let's go down. Let's go to 56. These are uh, acid naming conventions. And naming acids can, can spin your head around. I understand. So let's review that for a second. Uh, of these, we're going to find which one is incorrectly named of these three. So we got to look at each one of them, actually. So what are we looking for first when we see a formula? Is it an acid or not? If it's an acid, it starts with hydrogen. Okay, and it has to be an aqueous solution. If it's not an aqueous solution, it's by our definition, it's not an acid. So these are all said to be an aqueous solution. That's good. They all start with hydrogen. That's good. Now, what's next? 
is there oxygen in the molecule? If there's oxygen in the molecule, we don't say hydro. If oxygen is missing, we do say hydro. Right? So HCl would be hydro, and then the chlorine becomes chloric, hydrochloric acid. Right? That one's correct. How about uh, H2SO4? There's oxygen there, so you don't say hydro. You just look to the non-hydrogen part of the molecule, which in this case is a polyatomic ion, and it, it says that sulfate was the origin of the polyatomic anion, and eights become ix. So it's sulfuric acid. That one's correct. How about this one, H2CO3? You should always suspect when you see an oxygen in an acid like this, polyatomic ion. So what is CO3? Actually, it's CO3 two minus. That's the carbonate polyatomic ion. H become X, so it'd be carbonic acid. How about the other one? H3PO4, phosphoric acid. So when we say, let's go back the other direction. That is correct, by the way. When we say phosphoric, okay, when we say phosphoric, how do you work that back to a formula? You look at this. There's no hydro there, so it has oxygen in it. And phosphoric, it was derived from eight. So phosphate was the original anion in this one. So what is the phosphate? You might have to look it up. PO4, three minus, correct? So how many hydrogens does it take to balance three pluses? Hydrogens are nearly always plus one. three of them. So now you can write the formula. Uh, cyanic acid, wrong. It doesn't have oxygen in it. It has to start with hydro. Hydro cyanic acid. It's derived from the uh, cyanate ion. H become X, same as before. But you have to say hydro because there's no oxygen. Okay. Uh, let's see. Before we get to these tables and things, let me look at the other possibilities. Okay, we're going to fill in some tables and... Uh, do some other things. So here we are. We've got uh, 61. So how do you deduce these numbers that are in this table? You're given the things in black. Right? Those are given. You have to deduce the ones that I put in in red. This is the key, so it's got the answers already. But how do you get those answers? All right? Let's let's look at it. Here it is. PB, which is what lead, and its mass number is two o six. So, how do we get the number of protons from PB206, you got to look at your periodic table. Look at lead. What's its atomic number? 82. That's how many protons you have. 
How many neutrons do you have? 206 minus 82 is 124. All right, so far so good. How many electrons do you have? Is this charged? If it's neutral, the number of protons and the number of electrons is equal. So you have 82 electrons also. And the net charge is zero because there's no charge there, right? Where would the charge be? Upper right-hand corner, not there. So it has to be zero, okay? <clears throat> How about this one? All right, that one's not given. Right, so we have to work from what's given. Well, before we can put the charge that's given on it, we got to figure out what it is. 31 protons means what? Go to your periodic table. Look for 31 atomic number. That's Ga, which is gallium. So Ga is our symbol, and our charge is 3+. plus. So Ga 3 plus goes here. How about the number of electrons? How do you know the number of electrons? If you've got 31 positive charges, protons, and three of those are in excess, that means you can only balance them with 28 electrons. That gives you three extra positives. That makes the charge. How about this one? 52 protons means Tellurium. You look it up on your periodic table, TE. You don't even have to know what TE means. Just find it in the chart at 52 atomic number. Then the number of electrons is given as 54. So what's the charge? Well, you got two extra negatives, means two minus. And then you put the two minus on the symbol. That one's done. This one is given. MN2 plus, what is manganese 2, Roman numeral, ion. I mean, that's not part of the answer, but that's the name of it. Manganese 2, ion. How many protons? All right, look it up. Look on your periodic table, 25. It's got a 2 plus charge, so how many electrons? You got to be deficient two electrons to give you an excess of two pluses. So the electrons is 23 because 25 minus two is 23. All right. Uh, we would do the same type of reasoning down here, right? I'm not going to spend time on that. Let you do that one. Here are your symbols. You know your symbols. These. Any of these that I would put in this type of arrangement would be from those that I told you I want you to memorize. So any of those are fair game. Right? There are 118 elements in the chart. I probably gave you 55 or 56 right in that region to memorize. Right? Write the names of the following compounds. All right. So in this case, you would say, Fe is what? Iron. SO4. You wouldn't write iron sulfur oxide. You would recognize that as a polyatomic ion. Why? Because there are three or more elements in here. One of them is oxygen. Probably means that you've got a polyatomic. So you need to look for it. If you find an SO4 in that table, then you've got your answer. What's the charge on SO4? Two minus. So what's the charge on the iron? Two plus, which means it's iron, Roman numeral two, sulfate. Okay, here's a tricky one, C2H3O2. You wouldn't say sodium, carbon, hydrogen, oxide. <laughs> no, there's an oxygen there. Suspect, a polyatomic, go looking for it. Right? Sodium is going to be the positive part of this molecule. So probably C2H3O2 is a polyatomic. And it turns out it is. It's acetate. 
but sodium acetate makes it a type one compound. So you don't need a Roman numeral. Sodium can only be positive one. And acetate is a minus one. So that is unambiguous. Sodium acetate is the name and you can write the formula from it. No mistakes. NO2 is nitrite, polyatomic ion. Potassium, fixed charge, plus one. Calcium, fixed charge, two plus. OH is a polyatomic hydroxide ion. Minus one against two pluses means you need two of them. You have to use a parenthesis when there's a polyatomic. Calcium hydroxide. But since calcium is only one possible charge, and hydroxide is always minus one, you don't have to say what, what the uh, charge on calcium is. It comes from part of the table where the charge is fixed. Ni, what's Ni? Nickel. Where does it come from? It's a transition metal, so it's going to have more than one possible charge. CO3 is a carbonate. Two minus charge. Find it in your table. Nickel then would have to be a two plus charge because there's only one of them. So it's nickel two carbonate. Uh, let's see, this one slid off the top a little bit. The nitrate ion is NO3 minus. Now NO, that's not right. No, that's wrong. NO, it's not gonna, yeah, there it is. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to remember my command. Control E, I think. Yeah. Control E gives you this uh, editing bar, and it gives you the opportunity to put in superscripts and subscripts. So the nitrate ion should be, let's see, should be N O. And then three would be subscript. Oh, I see what's happening. Uh, okay, so that's all right. Three. And then it's a minus one charge. So then we would put minus one. And that would be, there we go. So that should be right. It's just not showing the NO3, NO. Okay, that's a problem. I'll have to fix that. I, I better make myself a note. I mean, to check the exam to see if it's got the same problem. If, if I put something like that in there, then I better check it. Be sure. All right. So how about the others? Aluminum oxide. Aluminum is always three plus. Oxygen is always two minus. Cross multiply, you get two aluminums and three oxygens. You're done. Ammonium ion, you should look that one up. Ammonium is a polyatomic ion, NH4 plus one charge. Perchloric acid. The perchlorate ion is ClO4 with a minus one charge. Make an acid out of it, you only need one proton hydrogen, a plus hydrogen, uh, a plus hydrogen is usually the most common isotope is a proton. Uh, copper two bromide. Copper two says the copper is two plus charge and Br is always minus one. So you need two of them. Okay. All right. So here we name some compounds. Uh, you can do that one. This one's got two polyatomics in it. When you put hydrogen as the anion, and this is a case where hydrogen does have a negative one charge, then you say hydrogen and you make the IDE ending, hydride. Sodium hydride then would be this one. Uh, dichromate ion, Cr2O7 is a two minus charge. Okay, now we got a type three compound. What does that mean? Both of the binaries 
in this compound are nonmetals, which means you say how many of them there are. There's only one carbon. It's first, so we don't say mono. We say carbon. There are four chlorines. We say tetrachloride. Carbon tetrachloride is CCLO4, Cl4, excuse me, CCL4. Here's silver chloride, right? And remember what I said, silver can only be a plus one charge. So silver chloride is correct. But for simplicity's sake, silver is also a transition metal. So I will accept silver one, Roman numeral one, chloride. Uh, uses are derived from it, so NO2 is nitrite, nitrous acid. Here's another type three compound. And here's a uh, tin. Now tin's not a transition metal, but it does have multiple charges possible. So you do have to say tin two iodide. Let's see, what do we have here? Write the formulas from the names. Thiosulfate, that is a polyatomic ion. Look up it up on your chart. You'll see what the charge is and how many sodiums you need. Uh, that one's new, that's a type three. That's a type two. Cobalt is a transition metal. Aluminum hydroxide, hydroxide is polyatomic, so you need a parentheses to make up three of them with a negative charge, three minuses to one, three plus. Sulfurous acid, derived from sulfite ion, SO3. Uh, nitric phosphoric acetic acid. Okay, why is it two ways here? All right, 84. I don't think I showed you this in lecture. The acetate ion, right, which is acetic acid would be this. Based on the formula for acetate, but I learned it a different way. And what the way I learned it was, was to give you a little bit of structure to the molecule. So there's the acetate ion also. Notice there are two carbons, three hydrogens, and two oxygens. This is derived from partial structure for the acetate ion, which would be like this. These are hydrogens from here, then another carbon, then an oxygen, and then an oxygen with a charge. Okay. This is the oxygen that holds the acidic proton. So if it were an acid, we just put a proton there, a hydrogen. Okay. So when you, if you see it this way, um, it's the same thing as C2H4O2 or HC2H3O2. Actually, that would be proper acetic acid. It should have one of these H's out here in front. That's that's really not proper. I don't know if I can fix it here. H. Yeah, okay. So that one's fixed. <laughs> I'll just save it. Um, and then another type three compound. Then we've got these others at the end. I'm not going to spend any more time because I'm already over 45 minutes and I need to get to uh, I need to open up my uh, Chem 103 tutoring session and stay there for a while in case anybody shows up. So I'm going to call it quits now and uh, stop the share. And you've got uh, between now and Monday to study and if you have any trouble you can contact me you know any way we can meet or if you want to uh, let's see 
No, Monday will be too late. I got a class in the morning, so I can't help you then. So you need to catch me before Monday if you have any questions. And let me see. Uh, Jordan, Sarah. Jordan, Sarah. Let me check something before you guys go. I should have checked with everybody first. Okay, Jordan, you, you're not registered with OWL yet. Uh, and uh, given. Okay, Sarah, you're okay. You're an OWL. Also, I should have mentioned to everybody if I didn't. Uh, if you don't, ha if you haven't submitted the syllabus test, uh, you guys are good. Yeah, you've got the syllabus test grade in there, so the exam will open up. If you don't have a syllabus test grade in there, then the exam will not open up for you. So I'm sure I'll get an email from a couple of people wondering why they can't get to the exam. <laughs> and I have to break the news to them. Okay. If there are no questions, we'll, uh, we'll close the meeting. And wish you a, a prosperous weekend. <laughs>